the AWS Financial Services Symposium, presented by The Cube. Good evening, AWS fans, and welcome back to wonderful New York City. We're here at AWS Financial Services Symposium. My name is Savannah Peterson here on theCUBE, joined by the fabulous John Furrier. John, we've had a really cool day. I, great content. I mean, this is a very intimate, targeted event. The, all the biggest banks and financial services folks are here. All the, the, the players, you got the banks, the insurance, all the industry leaders, the tech athletes, and it really is about the future. It's a glimpse into the future of what AI is going to bring. And this next guest runs the whole show Yes. I'm excited indeed. by the, his Scott. conversation. Scott, keep veteran. This is actually your day. We appreciate you letting us be a part of your big day. Well, we appreciate you being a part of this day. Thanks for being here, folks. Yeah. How's it been for you? To uh, this is one of my favorite days of the year. I can imagine. Uh, and really, for one specific reason, it's customers. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit. And John, you and I have had this conversation over the years. Listen, there's no better thing than a customer story. And so people don't come here to hear from AWS. Yep, we're here. Yeah. We're supporting Cast, but we're here to hear from customers. We're here to hear how customers are using AWS services to address opportunities and challenges and to convey that knowledge, to convey that experience in a way that hopefully means something to somebody else as they consider opportunities and challenges as well. And so today is chock full of that. And it's always one of the most amazing days we do. We've had a lot of your customers on the desk today too. And I can tell you, everyone's pretty happy. On the desk or behind the desk? Well, it depends on what you consider our hands right now. Are they on the desk or are they behind the desk? Well, they're above the desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, that's a good one. There you go, keeping us on our toes. Speaking of customers, you mentioned quite a few in your keynote. Can you give us some examples? Oh, man. Well, let's just start with the, the three that joined me on stage, right? Mm -hmm. So you start, you start the session uh, hearing from Bloomberg, uh, talking about what they built with Bloomberg GPT. They built that with Amazon SageMaker. They did that last year. Obviously, they have, they have now had a full year of being able to look at that, look at the results for themselves. It's not something they're externalizing. And I think Phil was very clear about that. They're building it for their own um, their own edification and for their own teaching and, and and looking at themselves and looking what they can they can build and maybe externalize. So that was an amazing story to actually have him start with a great picture of Mike in front of the very first terminal and to talk about the evolution of Bloomberg and how they're, they're leveraged technology all throughout the history of the company. As a former trader, as you probably heard me say in the keynote, it it's always kind of hits me in the feels when I see an old Bloomberg terminal because yeah. I use those things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then look, you go from there and you go right into S&P Global and you have Bivesh talking about uh, the fact that, you know, not only was he the CEO of Kinsor Technologies, which was acquired by S&P, he's now the chief um, Gen AI officer uh, for S&P. And just to hear how he thinks uh, about analytics and the application of analytics um, to solving problems, uh, not just for S&P, but also for customers, being able to offer that as value add to customers. I thought it was a really great example of how to actually take this and solve problems and look at challenges as well. You know, the thing that jumps out at us in the, in the interviews and watching all the content and the customers is that this real practical examples emerging. Yeah. And the customer experience is always talked about, of course, that's important, data's gonna drive that, but it's the outcomes on the business decisions, like uh, S&P, um, they help their customers make better decisions. So decision-making is kind of a broad term. It could mean anything. It could be users making a decision on a banking app that's better for them. So you're starting to see experience translate into value for the end user, your customer's customer. This yep. seems to be starting to see the fruit emerging good sign faster than we thought what's your how would you uh, scope the progress of where we're at right now as expected or oh pleasantly surprised great sign right anytime we're improving the lives of end consumers and by the way we're all in consumers it's a wonderful thing right that's what amazon's all about it's uh being uh, Earth's most customer-centric organization that's not just amazon.com that's aws as well so anytime we can actually use our services and our technology to actually make in consumers lives better with the help of large financial institutions or even fintech companies or anybody in between it's an awesome thing you know i love when you come on the queue because you always are customer obsessed with the, with the examples uh, but one thing that's clear in your area is banking and money are involved and the digital transformation to the cloud has been going on I won't say they're the fastest movie because it there's a lot involved. There's security, there's money. So it's a multi-year process to cloud and it's still going on. But now the generative AI is in play. How has that changed some of the power dynamics in your world with your customers? Because they still, they're still going to the cloud. 
and the numbers are still lower than like less than 20% are, are in the cloud fully. They've been going to the cloud. But what's the Gen AI impact? What's the, is it accelerating it? Is it, is it slowing things down? What's the, what, what's the impact of now the mandate that these experiences are going to be coming on board with cloud migration? Well, you know, we've talked about this in the past. Um, you know, I think the first mistake anybody can make when they're thinking about uh, modernizing their technology choices uh, is to think of the cloud as a place, as a destination. We're going to the cloud and it's binary. We're either in the cloud or we're not in the cloud. Um, that is that is probably the most tried and true way to actually fail at your transformation because the cloud is not an end. It's a means to the ends that you want to accomplish for your business. Hey, I want to open up new revenue streams and I want to be able to um, build new businesses as quickly as possible and get them into the market uh, and then benefit my customers and benefit myself more. I really want to lower my cost. I'm going to improve my efficiency. I want to increase my resiliency. That's what cloud does. It's a set of capabilities that actually help you reach the end that you're looking for. I think that that's a journey that continues over and over. It's a never ending journey, honestly. And so the digital transformation will continue until we've run out of ways to actually delight customers. Now, Gen AI, to your point, John, that's just another set of capabilities yeah. on top of what we've got. And what it's actually enabling people to do is actually, um, offload more and different to heavy lifting. So think about all the things that we've, we've done previously where it's like, you don't have to own your own compute. You don't have to own your own storage. You don't have to set up your own networking. Those are the basic building blocks, the fundamentals. Now it's, well, do you even need coding languages? Do right. you need developers to, to have mm -hmm. uh, a mastery of COBOL, which is an ancient language and also no Python, or do you just need your developers to, to work with Q to say, hey, this is the application I need to build. Start building that for me, Q, and I'll check in with you in about three hours to see if I like the direction you're building in and then maybe make some tweaks. That's where we're at today. And so the the rise of generative AI and the applications here is going to be um, continued uh, progress. You know, we talked about the S-curve in, the, in yeah. the keynote and people thinking that we're probably in the middle of the S-curve. We're not even at the very yeah. beginning yeah. of the uptick. The developer productivity and the appetite of developers to get some of this open source and AI capabilities is obviously there. Um, but there's also data is at the center of all these conversations too. Data as product now. It's not just data as an ingredient. All your customers, they're kind of full of data. They have a lot of data. And so data at, and software interacting becomes a big part of the conversation we're hearing today. What's your reaction to that? Well, how long, how long has it been since you used the term big data? <laughs> a long time. I didn't think about yeah that time and how much we talked about big data at that time. And then we talked about oh, wow. data and analytics and we talked about building data lakes and, and lake houses and all these things. All these things are important from an organizational construct, but they're only important to power analytics. We talked a lot about intelligence and we talked about the definition yeah. of yeah. intelligence, which is to really be able to actually acquire knowledge and skills. It's all about how do I have the capabilities to actually get to intelligence as fast as possible. And so to do that, to actually leverage generative AI, to get to intelligence, you've got to have your data organized in a way that makes it easy to do that. Well, yeah, and I mean, if it's not good going in, it sure isn't going to be good coming out. You, you mentioned intelligence, theme of the show this week, rethink intelligence. What does that mean? Well, it can mean a bunch of different things. And so that's kind of one of the clever ways that, that, you, that you frame a show but I'll give you a couple of things that we thought about as we as we um, kind of set the tone for today. Uh, number one, uh, you cannot go anywhere. You cannot turn on any channel. You cannot look at any media um, or even have any conversation with anybody without hearing the term generative AI. Right. Um, and I don't think that many people take the heartbeat that it would take to unpack what you're saying because it rolls off the tongue, Gen AI, Gen AI. But what is it? And what does it actually represent for human beings? So we spent a lot of time in the keynote yeah. talking about and unpacking. Well, it's all about intelligence. And what's happening now is that we now have an opportunity to rethink how we actually get to intelligence, how we get to the acquisition of knowledge and skills. And do we actually have to acquire them or can we just access them? And what Jennifer is actually doing is actually letting us as users just access them. We don't have to go and learn it deeply and become masters of it. We can access it when we need it. Or we can actually give it back when we don't need it. And so that was one of the riffs on Rethink Intelligence. But it was also an opportunity to think about all the tasks that we do as human beings today. How much of that stuff has just kind of, kind of go away. And we, we were talking off here earlier about the iPhone. 
Yeah. The advent of the iPhone and the App Store and all the different tasks that we used to have to know how to do, read a weather report, read a map, you know, go and look at our portfolio in a, in a, in a pink sheet book. We don't do that anymore. We just click the button and it's there for us. And so that's why we had the theme here is to give us an opportunity to sit back today yeah. and really think about what intelligence represents today and what it will represent in the future. Given that you have a really unique perspective talking with some of the biggest and best companies on the face of the planet in, in what you do, and you just gave that iPhone example, what do you think is going to be dramatically redefined in this new era of technology development that we're in now? How we work, period. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll point you to, to Q, right? We talked about uh, both Q for business and Q for developers uh, today in the, in, the, in the keynote and throughout uh, the symposium today. Just think about tasks. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of jobs, if we're honest, are just tasks. And then there are jobs that have some tasks and then some real you know, critical thinking. We're going to be able to free up developers specifically to do more critical thinking. If you're not having to write test scripts, if you're not having to run tests against code, mm -hmm. if you're not having to go and research, hey, is this what, what should I be doing? Am I using the right language? Am I actually going to get to the right outcome? If you don't have to do any of that and you can just focus on the idea that you were working on and trying to execute and have an assistant in the background doing all that for you, that's going to free up so many more people to actually be application builders. Well, and, and I love that you just brought that up because this one of the stats that always jars me when we're in all of our open source and cloud computing conferences that we cover is that developer time, only 27% of that is spent creating and doing creative work or coding or actually building. The rest of it is maintenance, everything you're talking about and, and fixing and patching. And we'll, when we think about, I mean, imagine what we would get if, I mean, not that anyone's ever at a 100% productivity during a, a given day, but you know, if we got even 50% more of that productivity back to them or creative time, who knows what people are going to make or create right. or, you know, I think, I, I, I'm curious for you, are there... Are you seeing a lot of trends across how people are adopting? Are you seeing, I, my impression, and actually this is a better way to phrase this question. My impression after today is that the financial services sector is adopting Gen AI and AI. Well, I mean, AI has been in the industry for a while, but adopting Gen AI with quite an incredible velocity that is perhaps faster than some of the technology adoptions that we've seen historically. Would you agree with that? I, I would agree with that, but I think it's because you can, you can do it so easily based on the foundations that have been set with cloud, right? If you didn't mm, have the cloud, that's such an important you point. wouldn't be able to have a uh, jar of AI. And so right. um, I think the trends that I'm seeing are, are probably what you're seeing as well. The early use cases are focused on productivity. Mm -hmm. Number one, how do I make my organization better? How do I equip my people, my knowledge workers, my developers with the ability to actually um, offload tasks and have access to information in a much um, easier fashion. That's going to save me money, hopefully, mm -hmm. but also free up, as you said, um, cycles for more um, productive things and things they can build new. Um, in financial services, you know, I'll give you an example. We talked to a banking customer. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, hey, we've got 100 use cases that we're working on for Generative AI. That's a lot. 100 yeah. use cases. 99 of them are productivity-based. They had one where they were beginning to consider what if we allow Journey Beta to actually interact with a customer by itself without a human in the loop? I think most organizations are thinking that way. They're looking first at, if I can master this for myself, mm -hmm. and then I can look to what's happening in the market, specifically from a regulatory policy perspective in relation to Journey AI, because we're still very early, mm -hmm. and how regulators are going to view that, what they're going to ask us to do from the standpoint of being able to actually um, prove how a decision was made, how it was arrived at, the data points that were there what models you used, why the inputs were the inputs that were and why the outputs were. I think most people are um, well, well, it, inching towards that, if you will, mm -hmm. but we're already seeing organizations looking at use cases beyond basic productivity for workers, but now we're just thinking, I've got an asset management team. What if I could have that asset management team create the content for their customer conversations and not present it to the customer, but now you have an asset or a wealth manager who's equipped they don't have to go and do hours of research on John. Yeah. They don't have to go and look at his past performance. It's at his fingertips yeah. right there to be able to have that conversation. Hyper-customization yep. is going to be such a part of the future. Anyway, yeah, go ahead, John. No, I was going to say, I mean, the platform shift is here. I mean, to me, the, the big walk away from the cube of all the events we go to is there's general agreement there's a platform shift. Uh, we've never seen this level in generations. Uh, some argue the web was one, the internet. It's okay, platform shift's happening. Developers are showing it with their appetite for uh, the new apps, the user experience, check. But the, right now, all the action, if you peel back the hype, is at the 
infrastructure level. Faster compute, faster XPUs, so more horsepower is coming in to accelerate that, that paradigm. So the question, well, first of all, do you believe that? And the second thing is that if more computing comes in, more resource, what happens next? What are you seeing with customers? Are they, because you said cloud's a big part, which we agree. Cloud's getting faster. There's more performance. A lot of hardware stocks are up. If we see the number, people are spending more. You guys do a lot more CapEx at Amazon. So as more compute comes in, more processors, organize the systems, what happens next? What's gonna, what's gonna emerge? Is it the data? Get smarter? Is it the apps? What's your, what's your vision on as more horsepower comes into the market? Well, I think the, the thing I, that I'm most certain of is as, as this continues to evolve and Journey of AI continues to change the way we work, that a lot of the stuff you just talked about, the, the compute layer, the storage layer, the networking layer, uh, for end users, that's going to continue to be abstracted away. That was already being abstracted away mm -hmm. by early investments in the cloud. But even more so now when you when you think about what's available with Q for Business, where if I'm a business user and a knowledge worker, um, I have the ability to interact with my firm's data without having to go and ask for permission or get my credentials and say, no, you know, how many times have you ever um, clicked on a link to go to a dashboard in your organization and suddenly it pops up access denied? Yeah. And then you have to write, no, 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 I'm John and I, I, I kind of own the place and I need to be, have access to this, right? And you hit click and then somebody eventually will, will open your ticket. That doesn't have to happen anymore because now, based on your permissioning within your organization, within your systems, um, Q will know what you can have access to or not. And so if John has access to the HR database, John can look yeah. at the HR database. If he doesn't have access to the financials, John will never be able to access the financials. And so I think you're going to see a continued abstraction yeah. away of what are the piece parts? What are the components and the, the primitives? Great answer. And I think I'd I just follow up and say, I would, so I'd follow up and say, okay, okay, I if you believe that to be true, which is cool. The builders who are building that abstraction, because we said S&P was a great example a year earlier, they essentially redid the tech stack for the app for their customer, which is very easy to use, solve some problems that they couldn't get before with elements of AWS. They got step function in there, they got Lambda serverless based. So they, they kind of assembled it, I mean, on the fly. So they use SageMaker. So all that stuff was in play, they're building. So the tech stacks are kind of getting morphed a little bit. What's your, what's your view there? Because those are the guys building right now. Well, it's going to be interesting, right? So, you know, AWS um, is, is purpose-built for builders. Now, you may have remembered our ads, you know, yeah. from a few years ago, you know, where builders build, right? And we still believe that in our heart. We're, we are a place for builders. Um, and that's a durable thing about AWS. Now, the most interesting thing about that is who the builders are is going to continue to morph and change because we used to say builders and we, we meant developers. And more and more, what we're going to find is, is that that's not who, who builders are. It will be to some degree, but it's, this is going to open up a whole new slew of builders who actually interact with things. They're not going to need pieces. They just need a prompt. Yeah, yeah. So and they don't even the need a system. cursor prompt. They just need a voice prompt. Like, I need to build an application that can look at all of the video content that the Cube has ever created and be able to catalog that and then tell me back things that I'm looking for, just like what we were talking yeah, about. Like what we're doing, yeah. So the build, so you're saying that builders are going to be beyond developers. The aperture of who's building is going to be increased. I think we're going to democratize building. I don't think that we're not ever going to have developers yeah. anymore. That's not what I'm saying. So don't, yeah. don't take it that way. We're still going to There's need a lot more work to do in the who are plumbing. deep in knowledge of how, how those components go together, how those pyramids work. But this is going to open up a, a whole yeah. new array of people that can actually build applications and make modifications yeah. to applications. Yeah. And do it in a way that's intuitive and natural to them versus having yeah. to learn. Well, and that's that's a key point. And so yeah. I have a colleague um, who's working on Q, and we were talking about, um, you know, why do we even have coding languages? We won't need them yeah. for very much longer in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way this person described it is, you know, when you think about what a coding language is, it's really a translation layer, right? From the things that you want to happen, and then you are instructing the compiler to actually go build your code for you. Um, and really, that's just squish. Right? It's a squish in the middle yeah. that we don't really need for long term because you don't need to be able to communicate that because it'll all just happen. You'll say what you want to happen. You'll get a result. If you like the result, you'll keep it. If you don't, you'll wipe it and you'll start anew. For the folks that didn't make it here to, to the event, again, great event, very targeted, very high octane. What's, what was the main content that you think um, people here walked away with? How would you globalize and summarize kind of the core 
themes uh, in the sessions, obviously the keynote you gave. What's the content? Well, how would you describe the elements here and how could they drill down and what, what's the prescription for post-event? I think the, the best prescription I could give post of that is if you're looking for real ways in which you can use technology and not just generative AI, but any technology to actually solve a business problem and how to do it, how to take those primitives and those components and actually put something together. Like you were going out to your garage, you're going to your, your own AWS environment and you're putting things together and you're going to say, let's see if this works. This is for you especially if you're a financial institution. And so many organizations struggle with moving from what I know today, how I operate today, you know, what worked yesterday is probably gonna work tomorrow for me. Maybe, maybe not, but you know what? I'm very familiar with it. Yeah. If you're looking to make a change, if you've got conviction that you need to change your organization, but you just don't know how, this is the event for you because this is how. You know, one of the things that jumped out at me in the conversations as I kind of wandered around uh, in between breaks is Bloomberg, you mentioned had it was a big presentation rethinking what they're doing visa was god was was a big hit visas yeah jim they're i won't say tough customer in a bad way but they're technical they have a lot going on and they're huge but jim spent a lot of time in his presentation talking about the the number of nines from the standpoint of of the durability resiliency that they have to offer uh, to their customers yeah. and to end financial consumers. And so uh, you say tough customer, I say great customer. They had customer. a high bar. They got a high bar. I say great customer yeah. because the best customers have the highest bars. And so yeah. we're, we're just very privileged to work with Visa yeah. uh, in the way that we are. Yeah. You know, Jim kind of gave some previews yeah. about some things that might be coming up this summer where you might be helping them in a big way. We're yeah. very excited about about how we're working so, with them. So we had a tough customer. It's like a New York slang. He's a tough customer. It's a compliment, actually. Uh. Hey, I'm a former New Yorker. I, I, I get it. I, I know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're never a former New Yorker. You had a New Yorker always. Yeah, but I mean, the visa no, visa represents like to me. To visa that. represents to me to me what um, the, the the high bar, the stakes that are in play here, especially in financial services uh, and all, other enterprises. There's a lot going on. That's their company, and the foundations are being either reset or recasted for bringing in the next decade. And I think that to me is exciting. Yeah, it's exciting for me too. Look, this is my industry. I've spent the entirety of my career in this industry. I've dedicated my career to it. Um, This is the industry I love. And so I love the growing responsibility that we have to this industry based on the the partnerships that we have. You mentioned Visa um, and the importance of the applications that they power for us as in financial consumers. Equally so, the relationship that we have with organizations like NASDAQ and the fact that we're powering now four of their exchanges in production every single day. That's awesome. Uh, it'll, that will only continue to grow with NASDAQ and with other critical providers uh, of really key um, applications that power the global financial system. We don't take that lightly. Yeah. We know the we know the importance of the role that we play uh, today in the industry, and it's only going to grow as more organizations um, continue to modernize the technology that they use. Scott, your passion and commitment to customers is is very visible, obvious, and and a part of your energy. And I love that. I've got two more questions for you. I want to ask you as an individual. So, uh, stepping outside of enterprise and thinking as as a, as a person, what do you hope this new technological revolution that we're amidst right now, the generative AI revolution, does for your family or your friends or your life? Like staying. You know, I think I'd go back to. Just tasks. Like, how, think about your life. Think about all the things you're responsible for, not just at work, but at home. Yeah. Or you might be part of organizations. There's just a lot of things that we do. Um, and when you sit down, and you take inventory of all the things that you do. And, and a lot of people sometimes, you know, you have to make a decision about, uh, well, am I going to take that task or can I actually afford to, to outsource it to somebody? Can I hire some help to do it? Am I getting extra child care? Am I getting somebody to mow my lawn? Or Just think about all the ways in which we can actually help people take tax off their plate to free up time for them. Time's the most precious resource that we have. Mm-hmm. I, ta- I talked about that with my team all the time. You heard me say it in the keynote yeah. today. Thank you for the investment of your time today. We want to make sure you get a return on that investment. That's not just because we're talking about financial services stuff. I really believe that. Mm-hmm. So to me, the most impactful thing that this can do is return time to people by taking away tasks. That's, That's the killer great. app of AI, great. time. Amen, baby. I love it. All right. Closing question for you, since you teased a little bit of this with the with the visa and, and later on announcements perhaps coming. When we have you on the show, as we've done many times historically, but let's call it this time next year, what do you hope to be able to say that you can't yet say today? Well, that's very challenging because if I can't say it today, I'm going to have a hard time talking about it. Um, <laughs> I would say 
Uh, I'll give you a little preview. I think reInvent uh, 2024 is going to be a fantastic show. Ooh. And so I would not, if I were anybody in financial services and you truly have a deep interest in understanding the impact that not just generative AI, yeah. but modern technology is having on the industry and will continue to have over the next 18 to 24 months, do not miss reInvent. I love that. Great, great plug for Raymond. Scott, you've been an absolute pleasure to have on the show. Thank you for making the time. It's been a real high ROI for us yeah. sitting here, and yeah. I, I, I very much value that. John, thanks for being a part of this rad day. Great. I feel so much smarter. Oh, yeah. I love this market. I, yeah, I, I know. It. I know. I really, I really a lot of it. money involved. Banks. I, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. It's hard, good, hard problems. Yeah, all we talked to insurance companies. We had a lot of yeah. conversations that was affecting. And thank you to our fabulous production team back there who made sure that we did a really beautiful job and to everyone on the Amazon AWS team who pulled together our curated list of fabulous guests. And most importantly, thank you for tuning in to these 15 fantastic segments that we've had here in New York City, AWS Financial Services Symposium. That's a wrap, baby. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, the leading source for enterprise tech news. <laughs>